Okay, so we thought, as we've talked about, this is intended to be a bit of a higher level conversation generally about rights and copyright, delving into some of the more specifics as we go later under the year in SDM plans, further um, webinars, etc. So one of the things we thought would be a really good place to begin is to try to understand exactly what we're talking about when we say this word, author's rights, copyright, or rights, particularly in the international background that many publishers currently have to operate in. It's no longer the same world that you only publish within your own specific territory. So what are we talking about? Globally, there are certain minimum global standards that provide authors with sets of rights. These sets of rights are either economic rights or moral rights, and they attach to what are original works of authorship, whatever may be the mode or form of expression, and they attach at the moment of creation. So automatically we can see that rights pop up everywhere because all of us all of the time are creating works of authorship in a variety of modes of expression and we're receiving all of these rights at the exact moment that we make that thing we make that work this obviously led, leads to lots of different rooms for global interpretation and while we're talking here about the Berne convention it's about 138 years copyright really has a much longer history Formalized, we can go back to about 1709, 1710 in the Statute of Anne here in the UK, our first actual copyright law. But copyright, you know, history, if you go into it, we can go back to 550 AD and the Battle of Kul Jemin and whether or not the Psalter with St. Columba could be copied, leading to the maxim that to every cow belongs her calf and therefore to every book belongs its copy. So even back here in 550 AD, this idea of a living right, that there's something alive in what it is that we're talking about, it's not quite the same thing as what might be considered real property, exists. And this has led to the concept that we currently hold and is codified in Bern, which is the idea of natural rights, meaning that every man here, this is a lot of different time zone, every person has a property in their own person and the things that come out of that person, you have a certain natural property right in those, um, in, in those uh, elements. This is very, very broad and generally natural rights, which we pretty much agree on, can be broken up into two big subsets. The droit d'auteur or the personality right approach, which was followed by a lot of European countries, where publishing is really an act of individual liberty. It's the idea that, that your work has your stamp of personality on it, and it's extension of your human person. And so it must be in some ways protected. And this is a little bit different than what might be considered the labor traditions of most notably in the UK and the US. In the US, enshrined in the constitution to promote the progress of arts and useful sciences. And here in the UK, we have the old copyright standard of skill, labor, and judgment, but both pointing at the underpinnings of copyright more being a reward for the investment you make in the creation of the works and not necessarily the droit d'autor, the personality right approach, where we are protecting things because they are an extension of you and a part of you. As this suggests, these different ways of looking at copyright naturally lead to different solutions, to different methods, to different nuances and how that right is applied to individual authors. I'm in a little bit of a note, even though it's not considered part really of our jurisprudence today, in the history of copyright, we have to acknowledge the influence of what might be called the utilitarian approach, meaning that although we understand there are these elements that are part of you and therefore are worthy and are part of your own original creation and so you should be encouraged to disseminate them by retaining some types of rights or control in how that work is disseminated there are certain utilitarian uses of works that may need to um, be taken into account and copyright as it has grown has definitely um, uh, taken advantage of these principles so what we can generally see here is that international copyright harmonization is very, very loose. 
It allows for lots of territorial flexibility, and it can be kind of a little bit to navigate. A little bit, you know, if you are from one territory as opposed to another, it might not be quite as instinctual for you to understand how their copyright uh, is attaches to um, any specific work. So, just by way of um, showing an example of this, uh, this is just a map of how long the economic rights in copyright last for works that are created today. To add other complexities to this map, if we were going to look at the length of the term of copyright protection in economic rights for works that were created, say, in the 1940s, it would look very different than this map. And this is a real issue. It happened quite recently here in Europe um, with the Diary of Anne Frank having different terms of copyright protection and meaning that different geo-blocking uh, exercises, et cetera, had to occur uh, in a publication effort. On top of this, as we just talked about, copyright has these economic rights and also moral rights. And if we were going to look at the term of protection for moral rights, we would also be looking at a completely different map with all different colors. Some territories such as France, moral rights can never expire while other territories, they might expire when the author does. So this gives you a little bit of the flavor of the international discrepancies and some of the challenges that publishers have in disseminating content throughout all of these international um, territories. So in these international territories, what rights are we really talking about? Again, we're talking about economic rights, which are usually alienable, meaning you can contract them away, give them away, have somebody else enjoy them or use them on your behalf, or moral rights, which I've already indicated uh, are inalienable, meaning nobody can ever take your moral rights and, and, and use them instead of you. However, in certain territories, they may be waived. In moral rights, usually the big ones that we think of are the right of attribution or the right to be identified as the author of the work and the right of integrity or the right to ensure that the work is appropriately treated. It doesn't, no one uses it in a way that either you know, does harm to your own reputation, the author's reputation, or in any way misaligns, misconstrues what it is that you were trying to say. Again, there are many differences in territories between the scopes of these rights, but they do work together. And one of the reasons that publishers need to be able to enjoy these economic rights, the rights of public, the publication, reproduction, making adaptations, et cetera, et cetera, is in order to ensure that these moral rights ensure that the right of attribution, the right of integrity, what we might see in our world, publishing world, as research integrity concerns, are, 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 are um, enshrined, are defended, that we are doing a good job of ensuring that things are attributed pro properly and that works are treated correctly. So they work very much hand in hand, although they are different subsets and rights. And one of the big reasons that we need to use these economic rights is for the very, very long life of a copyright protected work, as we just saw on that map, map you know, everywhere we're looking at minimum terms of lifetime of the author plus 70 years, that's a long time to manage and provide a certain stewardship over content that you are continued to be allowed to do this, therefore ensuring that certain research integrity concerns um, are maintained. So as we have, I mentioned a little bit in the beginning, copyright is balanced with exceptions, limitations, and defenses. So although copyright grants you these big bundles of sticks of economic rights and moral rights, there are a lot of balancing tools embedded within copyright. Some of these are principles or policies, and these are things like the fact that protection is only for the expression of an idea. You do not receive copyright protection for your actual ideas. If you had an idea that you wanted intellectual property protection for, you should probably go to patent law in order to receive it. So it's really what is the expression of that idea? This is in pretty much all countries really a bedrock of copyright law, but obviously there's many different nuances in how that is understood. In the US, they have quite a helpful doctrine called the merger doctrine, which means that when the idea and the expression of an idea become indissociable, that protection cannot be extend to, um, to, to that output, meaning there's only so many ways. And to say something, you're not going to receive protection over the way you said it, because there's very few other ways to, 
to make those types of creative choices. This leads into the idea that copyright protection should also only extend to what is original, original expression or original content. It's not going to extend to things that have been said or done before. This means that lots of things that are not original, there's no room for creativity, there's no room for authors' choices to be made, things like facts, dates, addresses, et cetera, et cetera, will generally have a harder time receiving copyright protection. So these are some of the, 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 the principles that undermine copyright, underlying copyright law um, in most international jurisdictions. And when we start talking about legal limitations or defenses, they must fall with what is called the burn three-step test, meaning that exceptions are only allowed in certain special cases that do not conflict with the normal exploitation of the work and that do not prejudice the legitimate interests of the author. As we saw, Byrne is 138 years old. What are the legitimate interests of the author? What are normal exploitations of the work? This is most likely changed over time. And SDM does play a valuable role in ensuring that these that this limits um, are, are defended and applied appropriately. But this is a quite a broad test again. This also allows for not lots of different national interpretations. So for example, in the US, you have the fair use defense, a defense to copyright infringement based on four factors, balancing factors. This is not the same thing in any way as the UK fair dealing defense, which I like to say sometimes of the spectacles or the glasses we put on when understanding whether or not a specific UK exception um, uh, is, is irrelevant. So as we can see, although there are, again, these certain kind of minimum global um, underpinnings that we all can understand and all uh, relate to, there are lots of different national differences. And that is because there's different national policy, public policy considerations and different things are important to different communities around the globe. So what is it that a publisher is to do? How do publishers do their job? Against all this backdrop of legal complexity, um, publishers do have a job to do. They have to ensure that they provide certain solutions for maximum dissemination of trusted content. That means they have to create tools to allow for the dissemination of this content. They have to manage that content potentially for quite a long time, ensuring that any issues post-publication are corrected and that things aren't lost as technological and technological pressures might come to bear. Um, we're all publishers, I think, you know, as you can see here, are kind of custodians or stewards over the published record. And they really do want to encourage maximum dissemination by allowing for different publishing models to be utilized that work best for different communities. And one of the ways that all of this is made possible is licenses. So there are many, many different options for licensing for different academic communities. So for example, we all might have heard of the differences between exclusive and non-exclusive subscription licenses, open access licenses, for example, the Creative Commons license and the many, many flavors that the Creative Commons licenses entails. Public licenses, these are usually things like works made by government employees, but there are a lot of different licenses um, for different communities and this allows for different communities to be able to uh, enjoy the rights that is best suited to the production and output and dissemination um, of their content. Uh, these stewardship, this idea of what publishers have to do and the job they have to do in this internationally complex world of copyright uh, is really about maximizing the legitimate use of the work. And here are just three of, I think, what are currently some of the big concerns on how we achieve that maximum legitimate use of the work. This is one, this is very different to just a one-off service. This isn't something that publishers are doing just once and then forgetting about it and then moving on. It is a continuing ongoing effort in order to stay up to date um, future-proof content, keep content technologically neutral, keep content accessible through all the wide variety of different territories and different experiences um, from our readers, using new technologies, working with libraries, et cetera, et cetera. 
There's also discovery and dissemination. How do we best make things discoverable? This is constantly changing. Things like referencing trackers, abstracting and indexing, different types of distribution services. And then perhaps what's you know, on the minds of everyone right now is research integrity. And how do we maintain the pressures that are being placed on the published version of record um, by a variety of different research integrity sense. Obviously, some of them intentional, things like plagiarism, et cetera, et cetera. But then some of them that perhaps might be through error or through people being, um, you know, using technological tools that perhaps they weren't uh, completely fluent in. But what we do know is that there are many, many different types of licenses uh, for many different types of communities that reflect the many different types of ways in which the scope of copyright is exercised within a particular territory. So licenses really do help to balance global rights. Different licenses support different choices. Licenses should also be read. It is important that you take the time, as particularly if it's a license that directly affects what you and you can do, that you read the license um, that's in front of you. This is in some sense a few times impossible. If we every single website we go onto has a license that probably says something about copyright in the terms and conditions. I think the latest study has said something it would take someone about five years of their life to read every single end user license agreement that they clicked, yes, I accept you, et cetera, et cetera. But what licenses you should read are the ones that really do affect you and help educate what you can do and how you can enjoy um, your own work or your other or, or, or other people's. So publishers are really keenly vested in this challenge of supporting rights and supporting um, you know, rights to be enjoyed by authors, particularly those moral rights of attribution and the right of integrity, um, while balancing the need to try to make sure that content is being widely disseminated and the content that is being widely disseminated is the trusted verified version of record, the one that has been invested in and is being kept up to date, it is being maintained, it is not just a one-off. So with all of that, I am gonna turn it over to Rebecca to talk a little bit more about some of the nuances of these licenses. Rebecca? Thank you, Leslie, and thank you, SDM, for inviting me today. That was a really great summary of, of the world of copyright. And um, I'm now going to get asked, Leslie, uh, if you can just move on to the next slide for me. It's going to be one of those seamless uh, coordinated efforts, hopefully. Uh, there we go. Perfect. So um, where we're going to move on to now is just understanding a little bit more about the practical implications of copyright when it comes to publishing um, your article with with publisher. So we're going to start off with looking at what public what publication agreements are so typically when um, articles are published um uh, with with publishers authors are asked to sign a publication agreement this is a separate license that sits on top of the work and it will detail a whole range of different um, obligations on the author and on the publisher and will also explicitly call out reuse rights now, these agreements provide uniform rights for publishers, so it enables publishers to manage the entire scholarly record at scale. So uh, we can be assured that you know, every article that's being published in one of the journals um, uh, that, um, um, that we're managing, um, it can be treated the same way without exception and ensuring that maximum dissemination and reach of that research. Now, as Leslie mentioned earlier, the, the rights that are um, relating um, to um, uh, the publication agreement and that are transferred to publishers to manage are those in the creative expression of the data, the research data, so the published article itself, not the underlying data. That's something that is is not um, covered by copyright and is something that can be used regardless. So what the rights are transferred is, is relating to that article. Now, publishers want to protect the investment in and the integrity of the version of record and the derivatives that, that may be um, derived from, from that version of record. But flexibility is always afforded for, for preprints and other article versions. No, so for uh, typically um, uh, under a subscription article, the author's accepted manuscript can be placed in an institutional repository, um, sometimes after an embargo period. And under um, open access agreements, versions of records um, can be um, uh, published um, and uh, put into an inst institutional repository immediately in line with the, the license types. 
So I want to just kind of, kind of cover some uh, specific examples um, and, and just kind of talk through a little bit more of the detail here. So subscription articles are typically, and again, I'm speaking, we're speaking typically, and you know, well, there'll be further webinars that will come and kind of delve into some specific cases, but usually a uh, copyright transfer uh, happens um, to the publisher as part of the publication agreements that the authors are asked to sign with a broad range of reuse rights afforded to authors explicitly called out in that agreement or in publisher um, related information. In open access articles, it, it can be it's slightly different. So normally the works are made available under a Creative Commons license, which um, it has um, the, uh, the standardized um, license terms, which are available um, as machine readable and on the Creative Commons license um, website, as well as on publisher websites too, um, with copyright retained by the authors under this model. However, authors then typically sign a publication agreement that sits alongside the Creative Commons license, in which any rights that aren't covered by the Creative Commons license are managed exclusively by publishers. And then another sort of type of um, publication agreement, which is very common and, um, and most publishers can uh, accommodate all of these different sort of flexible scenarios are for things like US government works, where there may be a separate agreement that's asked to be signed. Work for hire, where the authors may be working on behalf of an institution or a, an employer. Um, and publishers typically have already ready to go as part of the publication process, separate agreements which cover these scenarios where authors may not be the copyright holder or may there may be some work that um, is subject to local exceptions or some other employer obligations for the author to consider. So what I've done here is just pull together just a visual summary of some of the, the most common Creative Commons licenses. Again, this is not exhaustive. And um, just to lay that, um, uh, lay that, line that up against um, a typical um, a copyright transfer subscription article. Now, the, the, the kind of matrix here shows the rights that are granted under each of those license types um, in which no permission is required for end users. And in the orange ticks, permission would be required for end users. So on the right hand side, you have the most restrictive um, licenses, which articles are typically published under, in which end users would have to ask to do all of the, the, the things that are noted um, to the Creative Commons Attribution License, the CC BY license, which end users are able to do all of these, um, these things noted here. So read, download, share, use non-commercially, commercially, and um, create uh, derivatives and translate um, uh, without the need to ask for permission from either the author or the publishers. It's worth noting at this stage that when we hear a lot about author rights retention strategies, most of the time, what that means in practice is that authors are being asked to um, make their work available under the Creative Commons Attribution License and don't have that choice of the other licenses we mentioned here, um, which means that um, end users can do all of these things without the need um, for further intervention by the authors or, or by publishers, which in some cases may be unfavorable, particularly if authors do not want their work to be reused commercially. So speaking a little bit more about author rights here, I think we've, we've you know, we've mentioned on a couple of occasions um, so far in this discussion that um, author rights are, are very important to publishers and, you know, publishers very much see themselves as custodians and stewards of that, of the scholarly record. But, you know, a fundamental element of that is the authors who are creating that work. And it really is at the heart of you know, the policies that all publishers are look to put in place to ensure that authors are able to use that work freely, have their careers supported in the way that they need to with the, the work that they're publishing. So most publishers um, and well, poll publishers, but typically allow authors a whole broad range of reuse rights to cover the reuse of their own work. So things like the retention of moral rights, so the rights of integrity and fraternity, as, as, uh, as Leslie mentioned earlier. Um, the retention of trademark and patent rights, um, the retention of the rights to reuse their research data freely without any restriction, um, and um, to receive proper attribution and credit for their published works. These are things that kind of are, are very standard and kind of almost go without saying, but are very much called out in those author publication agreements to ensure that authors understand what um, they're transferring rights to and what rights are retained by them. 
Um, very importantly for authors, sorry, Leslie, can we go back? <laughs> Just very importantly for authors, because I know this is something that comes up all the time, is authors are always asking whether they can reuse their own material in new works. And, and the answer absolutely is yes. Um, you know, there's full, uh, providing this full acknowledgement to the original source, that's a kind of key component in most publishers' uh, um, author rights policies. And, and being able to build on that work, whether that be another journal article, whether it's republishing it in a book, whether that's a non commercial or commercial book are all things that are, are very much fundamental and, and part of the basics of, of author publishing agreements for most publishers. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, just sharing the preprint on websites um, uh, or repositories. Again, publishers will clearly and make explicit what rules of the road that authors need to adhere to, but the principle remains um, fundamental um, to, uh, to most publishing agreements. And then moving on, you know, I think um, there's, uh, again, practical terms, again, we're talking about uh, publishers wanting to support authors in their scholarly practice, in their careers, in their institutions. Um, one element that's fundamental to a lot of publishing agreements is being able to use and share works for non-commercial and some commercial purposes. So things like um, presenting their work in a lecture, a class or a conference, um, using their work with students, with colleagues, um, uh, using in a thesis or dissertation in which, you know, the, the published output is, is often uh, critical to that. And in um, with other numbers of people, and there are um, some schemes that are, are available where publishers can make links available for this ad hoc sharing. It's also the case that some um, publishers allow um, some limited commercial um, reuse rights to, to to authors, including, for example, an author making available their work to be sold in their local coffee shop in their in, uh, in their university. So I'm just going to cover here before we uh, move on to um, some questions, uh, just some common misconceptions that we hear. And I think um, the the excellent document that STM have pulled together is available in the, the chat and on the web STM website. So I really would urge everyone to go and have a look there. But I'm just going to talk through a couple. Um, you know, publishers are, uh, are sometimes say we don't need these. We don't need rights to support research integrity. Now, as Leslie mentioned, you know the the moral rights um, that um, uh, are kind of uh, are fundamental to to copyright are also very much linked to those economic rights. And with publishers being stewards and custodians of the version of record, we need to be able to manage that um, the the scholarly record at scale. So having uniform, exclusive rights enables publishers to do a whole range of things, not least of which bring enforcement action, address issues of plagiarism, ethical disputes, civil proceedings and also making sure that we can properly ensure that if there are reuse requests coming from outside of the original author, that we can um, give very clear instructions about how that work can be built and shared upon in a way that respects copyright and respects the integrity of the original work. And I'll just finally leave at this point, which is, um, I think, something that um, those of us who are publishers here an awful lot is that um, particularly those of us working in copyright is that we're, we're looking to kind of control or restrict authors reuse of their work. And I'm hoping that this whole discussion so far has made it quite clear that actually that that, that really isn't a, you know a, 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 an objective of publishers. We want to make sure that the 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 scholarly record is disseminated at scale, that there's reach and that there's meaningful impact for the work that's being published with us. So that's why publishers make it really explicit in their publishing agreements, in their author information, the whole range of permitted rights that authors have that um, are designed to enable that dissemination, supporting their careers and their activities. And as Leslie said, this isn't just a one and done for us. This is something that we commit to for the entirety of the life of that work globally, understanding all of those different kind of copyright implications in those different territories and making sure that the, the you know, the practical implications of copyright and publishing uh, are not having to be the concern of authors and that we can enable authors to, to use and build and share upon their work and, you know, uh, and fulfill their research objectives whilst taking that administrative burden and the complexity around managing those rights um, uh, on as one of the kind of key services publishers offer to the, to the research community. So I'll uh, thank you all for listening to both Leslie and I. I think um, we will uh, stop sharing so you'll be able to see us again and um, hand it back over to um, to Sarah to see if there's any questions from, from the attendees for, for Leslie and I. Thank you. And thank you very much to both Leslie and Rebecca. I think that they were very interesting presentations and your knowledge of this area is 
phenomenal. So thank you both. Um, I have got a few questions. If anyone, just a reminder, we've got about 10 minutes now before we, we sign off. So any questions that you have, um, you know, your opportunity to ask that burning issue that you've always wanted to check with an expert, they're here. Um, there are, just, just kick off with the first one. You've given, you touched on this, but would you both be able to give in your experience some more examples of the types of queries you regularly receive from authors who aren't sure about what copyright is and, and what rights it gives them, it gives that they, they actually have in practice. I don't know who would like to take that one first or if you both like to take it, leave it up to you. I'm happy to start with that. And I'm sure Leslie will, I'm absolutely certain Leslie will have something to add um, here. So I think it, it's it's often, you know, not, not always well understood exactly what authors are signing when they're signing publication agreements. And I think, you know, a lot of publishers are working really hard to try and make it really clear and transparent what they mean in practice and, you know, dispel some of those myths that we've been mentioning and that are covered in, in the STM um, uh, document that's um, available to be shared. Um, so I think for us as publishers, we really see that, you know, making sure that it's really clear to authors that they, in most cases, don't even need to ask um, uh, whether they're, when they're reusing their own work, it's something that's inherent in their in their publication agreements, uh, making that clear to them, addressing those questions, supporting them if they have any complex or uh, complexities or queries, which often do come up about reuses, and making sure that if others are coming to them and asking to reuse their work, that we can take that burden from them, we can uh, offer, you know, our expertise and making sure that their, their works are being used appropriately and cited correctly and that the research is being built upon effectively. So I think from, from my perspective that those are the sorts of questions we, we hear quite a lot. Yeah, I would really second that. I think one of the biggest areas is, is people just, as I say, read the license. If that is a subscription license, if it's an open access license, I think publishers really are invested in trying to help people understand what CCBY means, what it means to sign an LTP, all of these different choices, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone is understanding this every single time. So how do we really make it clear? What are the real world impacts? Because every choice you make will have actual impact on what will happen to your work for the very, very long life that it will hopefully enjoy. So I would, I would second what uh, Rebecca said there. Thank you both. We do have a couple of people who have their hands up so I'm going to um, unmute the first person, hopefully I will try, who wants to ask that question directly. So let's just see if this works. OK, um, thank you. Yes. Thank you. So um, really appreciate uh, sharing you know, the, the PowerPoint and your yeah, presentation. So I was wondering, you also mentioned in the retraction right. So uh, in the agreement between the publisher and authors, is that retraction rights? Who decides whether the author has the retraction right? I think that when we're talking about retractions, it's a little complicated because there's so many different ways in which a retraction might be prompted. I know just from our own experience, a retraction can occur because an author has suggested something because a third party has spotted something or for many, many other reasons. So I think that it really depends what is the instigator behind that retraction. When it comes then to how rights are treated, again, it becomes a little bit complicated. And I imagine that there's a certain amount um, of diversity throughout the marketplace, depending upon what that instigating uh retraction was we don't I know one of the issues is perhaps you know we do, don't want retraction just because people feel like it. we don't want censorship to kind of creep in to what is retraction for good reason there should be underlying reasons involved in that and I think a lot of publisher agreements will go into some detail or publishing policies even explaining what are the specific steps that would lead to that how retractions would be judged and then what the output of any particular retraction activity would be um, Rebecca, Sarah, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. No, I was, I was just going to say that, you know, I think a lot of that is governed by uh, publisher policies, which they'll, they'll make very clear on their own websites. And I think every pu publisher will take a different approach to that. But um, that information should be available for, for authors to be able to scrutinise and understand ahead of time when they're making their decision about where they're going to publish their article. 
Okay, so is retraction right usually include in agreement between the publisher and author? I think it's impossible to say that. I, I hope we've highlighted there is no one answer. As someone who's worked in copyright my entire life, I know everyone would love that it'd be a simple formula for copyright that we could put everything into and it would spit out what the actual answer is all the time. But copyright's very human. It's a very long history. It's embedded within us. And it's as humans are very complicated and not fit into easy mathematical boxes. Um, neither do a lot of these issues. But I agree with what Rebecca said. I do think that most publishers, particularly SDM publishers, will have clear policies, a web page that will really explain what the retraction process would be, whatever any outcomes of a retraction decision would be, what any steps they would take in terms of correcting the record or making that known. Um, and I think that would probably be the better, that, that would be where you would look, because it's not just for the author, retractions really are for all of us in order to understand what has happened to a certain publication. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. I just to totally reiterate what you've just both said, I think publishers are very, clear on their own retraction policies and you can usually find the information on the website as to the process they follow but I know they do engage with the author throughout to recognize it's the author's work. Um, can I ask people to put comments in the chat rather than probably put their hands up just to make sure that we cover everybody's and avoid duplications. We do um, have one more with the hand up which I'll if I can do it I will do it and then yeah if we could move on to the chat let me just see if I can unmute. Yeah, Great. thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I just uh, had a question, and in fact, I think it applies to the last question as well, um, about whether authors retain retraction rights themselves or what other rights authors retain. Uh, one of the points I think Rebecca made was that authors, under most circumstances, have the ability to reuse their own work um, and don't have to ask for permission. But as an author myself, when I get uh, a Creative Commons license that has NC, non-commercial or no derivative restrictions, um, even in cases where that license is a non-exclusive license, um, the language in most publisher agreements is quite clear that authors are being treated like end users. There's, there's typically language in there that says, whatever rights the end user has under these NCND agreements, uh, NCND agreements also apply to authors. Authors are being moved from the category of being creators to being moved to the category of end users. And this is quite contrary to the original intention of the Creative Commons license, which was a mechanism by which authors can retain their rights and assign the needed rights to say the publisher to publish the author's work or rights uh, permissions to grant to other third parties to do whatever the third parties needed to do, but ultimately those rights were retained by the authors and those assignments were made by the authors. Um, the current system, of course, flips this upside down. And so publishers are asking authors to grant them everything and then all publishers then grant back things to the author. Um, so I guess the question, I just want to be really clear, if, if authors were able to retain all of their rights and share them not exclusively with publishers, give publishers all the rights that publishers need to do whatever publishers want to do with the work, but allow authors to retain all the rights, the same rights as the publisher in a non-exclusive way, then questions around reuse, derivative use, um, questions about uh, retractions, anything that the author wants to do with the work, the author is free to do so. So Rebecca, if you could clarify, how can authors continue to reuse their own work and not have to ask for permission when the publishing license to publish agreements clearly state that authors are treated in the same way as end users uh, with non-commercial and no derivative restrictions? Yeah, so it's a great question, and it's something that we we kind of grapple with all the time. And I think the, I think it kind of goes back to the point about us being able to manage the the, the record at scale, and having that exclusivity enables us to do lots of things that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do. So things like bring enforcement action in certain jurisdictions where that's that's a requisite. I think the most important thing for publishers at the moment, and is you know, as uh, there's there's a real push for a greater understanding of of author rights and making sure that authors don't feel disenfranchised from their work, which is absolutely not the intention of publishers, is for publishers to be engaging very actively with author communities, with other institutions, to figure out you know where are those uh, those areas in which um, uh, current publication agreements maybe aren't clear or. or or are preventing authors 
from doing things with their work that um, are, are causing these points of friction. And then I think working very collaboratively together with those stakeholder groups is a real priority for, for many publishers and, and particularly STM. And I think this is what, you know, is kind of what's prompted the, this discussion from, uh, from STM is to see how we can find a way forward that means that publishers still can, you know, maintain their investment in the diversion of record, can manage that, the, the scholarly um, the scholarly kind of corpus of content at scale, do, do things to sustain uh, research integrity, make sure that we can, um, and, you know, can use the work in, in all the ways that Leslie's talked about, whether that's including in licenses for abstracting and indexing services, being able to use in aggregators, being able to, to look at, um, uh, you know, all the ways in which the, 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 the um, uh, kind of scholarly content is made available, but ensure that we're not disenfranchising authors, that we're making sure that those use cases are, are being covered accurately in our publication agreements and that there aren't any unintended consequences I suppose of, of, of flipping models without you know really thinking that through so I think that's a real priority for, for many publishers and is absolutely something um, that we'll continue to work with and engage with relevant stakeholder groups to make sure that we're finding a way forward that you know suits both sides and is, is keeping those principles at the heart of the matter. And if Leslie, if you have anything else you want to add from your perspective on, on that, that question. And I think you really highlight what I, we've been trying to tease out here. The Creative Commons, for example, it is a public license, which means it, it governs every single person in the public, including the author, including the person who, um, you know, who created the piece. They are still part of the public. It's a very different type of license. Understanding what those nuances are, what the implications of choosing that route I think is something that authors really, you know, they do need to be a little bit more empowered to understand what the details, what the impact and what the effect of those choices um, would be. But I am aware that we're at time, so I'll pass it over to Sarah for final thoughts. Yeah, and I was just going to say, just to add to what Rebecca and Leslie have, have just said, is if well, when we mentioned at the beginning, or Molly mentioned at the beginning about the new guide that's up on the STM website, I would encourage uh, people to to look at that because there there are some details in there of rights that authors do have um, that others don't often not for all publishers or speaking very generally but for a number of publishers mm -hmm. authors do have rights to post on repository institutional repositories maybe after an embargo but certainly they are and therefore in a different category for some other some some versions of articles so it's worth having a look at that um, yeah unfortunately we are at an end of time so. I just wanted to again thank thank STM, thank Leslie, thank Rebecca for giving up their time today for a really interesting conversation, which, as we said, hopefully will be the first of a series this year on this very important topic. And I wanted to, as before we finish, um, give give both Leslie and Rebecca the chance to sort of if they had to give one takeaway that they'd like to leave you with today, what that would be. So in order of how they when they spoke, I'll go to Leslie first, and yeah, if you could just give your one takeaway, that would be great. Well, I think it's no secret it would be to read the license. Uh, licenses, you know, do encourage a rich, diverse publishing economy, and these require different types of licenses. So understanding the license that you choose, speaking to your publisher, help that, using them, they often will have great resources to help you to understand what that license is, but to actually read it. Rebecca? Yeah, and I think to, to, to build on that, and it's probably no secret that uh, Leslie and my answers are going to be somewhat similar. Um, but I think um, the the important thing is understanding that publishers really don't want to disenfranchise authors from their rights. We want to make sure that all of those uses that are, are kind of fundamental to the concerns of authors are, a, uh, are able to be uh, done within the parameters of the the agreements and the infrastructure that we have in, as publishers. And I think in most cases, those uh, those use cases are there; they're detailed. So if you read your license, you'll probably find there's many things that authors can do with their work that they don't need to ask for permission for that will cover those those issues. But, you know, broadly speaking, there's lots of um, engagement going on with between stakeholder groups. And this is not a topic that we're going to stop talking about. And I know um, there'll be much more to come from STM and, and from other members who will be able to impart their wisdom over over the coming months. That's great. Thank you. Molly, did you want to, to finish? Sure. I just want to thank uh, Sarah, Leslie, and Rebecca. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us very articulately and clearly. Thank you so much to our audience members for joining us. And please uh, do watch the space for more conversations in the near future. 
Thank you all. Thank you, everyone, for Thank joining. You. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.